Hello friends, welcome back to a new week. This week we are reading three stories about a murderer, a ghost, and a monster. It's a pretty good week, <laughs> I'd say. You will also see on Canvas that I posted the instructions for essay number one. Don't panic, it's not due for some time, so don't freak out about it yet. Um, I like to give instructions out earlier when we first start a reading rather than at the end um, for a couple of really simple common sense reasons. When I was in college I had professors who would make us read a book and then at the very end of the book we would get the, the essay questions assigned and that used to drive me nuts because then you have to try and go back and remember where where things happen in the story, where where information could be found again. Um, and it ended up being a really big and difficult task. So instead, I like to give the essay questions out in advance of the reading. Uh, that way, if a question looks good to you, if there's one that already grabs your attention, then as you read, you can start picking up the clues as you go. You can find the little Easter eggs you need uh, in order to support that particular question. Or if you don't know what you want to write about yet, at least you have the options in front of you so that as you begin to read, maybe a response becomes more clear to you as you go. All right, for this first essay, you are going to be basically presenting a case to a jury. And you are either going to be a prosecuting attorney, which means you're a prosecutor who is trying to send one of these characters we're reading about to prison for the rest of their lives, or you are going to be a defense attorney and you are defending a character and trying to keep them out of prison and instead send them to a mental institution where they can get the help that they very much need and deserve. So after you read the three stories, you are going to choose a character that you like best, one that jumps out to you the most, and you are going to decide if they are sane and should be sent to prison, or you will decide they are insane and instead need to be sent to a hospital for some help. And the way you're going to do that is to define them using the official definition of insanity, the legal definition of insanity that I've given you on this paper. And you're going to find the clues in the story that you need to build your case. And I know it seems like, well, how is it possible that I can read a story and you know, I can defend a character while someone else might prosecute them. I mean, which, what's right? Which answer is correct? The thing is, the three stories that I've selected <laughs> can really go either way. So whichever option you decide to write about, I promise you, in whatever story you pick, you will find enough clues to support whatever you want to say about them. And this is where structuralism is going to come into play. Remember, you're going to build your case for the jury using the rods and wheels, right? The little details of the story. And you're going to build a complete case um, to convince that jury to either convict this person or let them go and send them to get help. Just to break these instructions down a little bit more, let me show you exactly what I mean. This is all written down in your instructions, but I just wanted to go over it really quickly to make sure you understand what I'm asking of you. So again, if you decide that you want to be the prosecutor, that means you are sending the character you are writing about to prison. And in order to do that, you need to convince the jury of three things. Number one, that the character can distinguish between fantasy and reality. Number two, that the character can tell right from wrong. And number three, that they can control the, their behavior. Now, if you find enough clues and evidence from the story to prove each of these three things to your jury, then you are showing them that the character was completely sane during the moment of their crime and they need to go to prison. On the other hand, if you decide you want to be a defense attorney and you are trying to defend and protect a character, this means you're trying to convince a jury that they are legally insane and they need to be sent to a mental institution to get some help. And in order to build a convincing case, you need to show these three things from the story. Number one, that the character cannot distinguish reality from fantasy. Number two, they cannot tell right from wrong. And number three, they cannot control their behavior. They really don't know what they're doing. And if you can convince 
a jury of these three things for your client, uh, then they can go get the help that they desperately need. And that's pretty much all there is to it as far as what I'm going to be looking for from you. So you get to choose which story you want to write about, so which character jumps out to you. You may decide to go with the one that you're like, ooh, that one, <laughs> that guy is crazy. Or you might find a character that you feel maybe strangely sympathetic for. There, there are a couple of these characters depending on how you see them. Uh, so you get to choose the character and then you get to choose which side you're on. You're going to send them away or are you going to protect them? Uh, like I said, we have a couple of weeks where I'm going to give you samples. I'm going to show you how to build your essay. So everything you might be nervous about right now, take a breath. <laughs> We're going to go over this together. I'm going to leave very little mystery here for you. Um, so that as scary and as intimidating as this might sound right now, don't worry. Just go with me on this. So if you have not read the stories yet, go ahead and and stop me. <laughs> stop this video right now. Go ahead and read the stories uh, and then come back to me because we're going to have a little book talk here. I'm going to go over a couple of details to show you um, some elements of sanity, some elements of insanity, but it's probably better you read the stories first, otherwise this probably won't make too much sense. So if you haven't read these, I will see you in just a little bit. Welcome back. I am going to be starting with The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe, one of my favorite writers, and this is one of my favorite stories. And as short as it is, and as hopefully a, as a quick and easy read as it was, if we start peeling back the layers, there's a lot going on here. The first thing I want to point out is that the story is written in first person. Uh, that means the narrator, the one telling the story, is also a character. Our narrator is the main character, and he is speaking directly to you. And in this case, I think it's safe to call the story a confession. He's telling you all of his secrets. So we don't know his name. We don't know the narrator's name because you don't <laughs> reference yourself when you're telling a story. You never say, well, Trevor is upstairs working. Trevor is recording this video right now. Trevor's going to write some shit down. Like we don't we don't do that. And when we hear people do that, it's they're 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 crazy. Usually, I will ask my class to come up with a list of adjectives or descriptive words um, to describe this narrator. And this is usually kind of in a nutshell uh, the list of words I usually get deranged, nervous, paranoid. He has halluc hallucinations because remember he tells us at some point that he thinks he can hear every sound not only on earth but he can hear all the noises in heaven and hell. Uh, we know he's violent. Uh, as the story gets going we start to see that he's a very good and effective liar. Uh, and down below I always get students telling me that he's crazy. And I put that in quotes because that's sort of a slang term. In your writing, you want to use more academic language. So instead of crazy, which is sort of a pejorative term, kind of a lazy word, you want to use words like, you know, deranged is a good one, insane. Now, since we're talking about a first-person narrator, anything he tells us is fair game here, right? Because all of the words in the story are his. Um, so as far as the crime goes, he has a landlord who's an old man, and as far as we know, they have a great relationship. It's almost sort of a tender relationship. They're like father and son. So it's rather shocking when this narrator decides to kill the old man. And the reason he does it is for a very unusual reason. And I'll read it from the story here. Remember, whatever you're doing, whichever side you're on, think of the character's words. They can be used for or against them. And this narrator tells us about the murder. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. <laughs> okay. So he decides to take a human life for something as silly as an eye that makes him uncomfortable when he looks at it. 
which is why I think a lot of students like me to put <laughs> crazy on the board. Another word we can probably consider for this guy is he's very meticulous, right? This narrator is very detail-oriented, and we know that he spends days planning this thing and even rehearsing the murder by creeping up every night and kind of looking in on the old man. Um, it's a real test of his patience, even to there's this creepy scene where it takes him something like an hour just to get the door open a tiny bit, and you can feel that anxiety and that aching patience that must have taken just to do that. But there's an accident. One night his finger sort of slips on the lantern door and makes a noise that wakes up the old man. And for this, this excruciating length of time, the two men are very aware of each other and they're just sitting there in silence. So our narrator is triggered and he goes to kill the old man. He flips the mattress over on top of him and suffocates him. And then just to make sure that he gets rid of all of the evidence, he chops up the old man's body <laughs> and buries them underneath the floorboards of the house. That should have been the end of the story. He could have gotten away with it, except we know that the neighbors heard the old man screaming and called the police. And when the police show up, our narrator has a brand new problem he has to deal with. When I mentioned that the narrator was a good liar, it's because when the police showed up, they said, hey, we heard screaming, what's going on here? And the narrator, well, you can read in the book what he tells them. And that shows a man who can think very fast on his feet. He's able to come up with an, expl an explanation right out of thin air, just grabs onto it just like that. In fact, we know that he is feeling very confident about what he's done because he invites the police officers into his home and has them sit in, to, sit in chairs that are right over the pieces of the dead body. So as our narrator, our very cocky narrator, is toying with the police officers, kind of in the back of his mind, right, right around here, he starts to hear a ghostly heartbeat, just very low at first, and then it gets louder and louder. Um, and we can assume that he thinks He's hearing the heartbeat of his victim, of the old man under the stairs. He knows this can't be possible, so he's starting to panic. Uh, so this is probably his guilty conscience chiming in here and, and reminding him of what he's done. And the beating gets so loud that he assumes the police officers can hear it, but they don't react. So now he thinks that the cops are toying with his mind, which is just taking an already very dangerously unhinged man <laughs> and making things things even worse, to the point where he explodes, he confesses, right? He rips up the floorboards and says, all right, I did it, you caught me. But nothing happened, nothing <laughs> made him do that except his own guilty conscience. Um, it's this ghostly heartbeat. Or is it a ghost? At first glance, it's easy to assume this is a ghost story because the title of it is called The Telltale Heart. The word or the phrase telltale means tattletale, the tattletale heart. The heartbeat is telling on the murderer and causes him to confess. Um, so it seems like a very tidy ghost story where the ghost is coming from the dead uh, and punishing the man who murdered him straight into a confession. But that's the, the crazy, that's the crazy part of the story, right? Um, but what if it's not a ghost? What if it's not supernatural, but he is hearing a heartbeat? Whose heartbeat might he be hearing inside of his own head? Most likely his own, right? He is in a heightened sense of stress right now. Um, he is very anxious. He is very nervous. He's got cops here he's trying to get rid of, right? He's trying to get away with a crime here. Um, so he is very, very panicky. He's on the brink of panic. And we can see that sense of panic getting worse as the story progresses right into the climax. He's probably so scared that he is hearing his own heartbeat in his head. Haven't you ever been so scared or nervous that you can hear that blood pumping in your head? So we could have a very natural, biological explanation for this telltale heart. So there is a lot here in this story that if you wanted to send him to, to a mental institution, you absolutely could. Um, nothing he does is within the realm of what you and I would consider normal behavior. But if you wanted to send him to prison, there are some things you can consider. Number one, 
as crazy as it sounds, he had a motive. You don't murder someone unless you have a reason. It doesn't matter what the reason is, he had one that he's able to articulate and define. Not only that, he tells us. He tells us. Um, you also have to consider the fact that in the beginning of the story, he tells us, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I'm not. So there's another opportunity where his words could work against him. Of course, that could be the ramblings of a madman, right? Crazy people don't know they're crazy, so that can work in either favor. There's also the fact that he is a very good liar. Uh, and there's also the fact that what he was hearing was, was not supernatural at all, but something very natural and biological and physical happening inside of his own skull, something most of us have experienced before. So either way you want to go, you have plenty of evidence there to support you and whatever it is you want to try and convince your jury of. The next story was The Yellow Wallpaper, and this is from 1892. And I want to throw that date out to you, just kind of stick it in the back of your mind, uh, because we have a narrator who is a woman, um, and it's all about her experience as a woman inside of this house. And it's very important for you to be mindful of what life was like for women in 1892. So we're talking about the Victorian era. Not a great time for women, uh, and we'll talk about why. So again, I just wanted to throw that date out to you, um, just to kind of help you paint a clearer picture of what, what time we're in, and why it seems like all of these forces are sort of coming down on top of her and making her life and her recovery from illness very difficult for her. Again, in this story, we are dealing with a first-person narrator. So the lady telling the story is a character, and she's telling us everything that happened to her. She's sharing the experience with us. And usually when I ask students to come up with a list of adjectives for this narrator, these are the most common answers I get. Depressed, lonely, isolated, scared, mentally ill, controlled. Um, and I think students usually mean controlled by others, which would make sense. Um, you can see this list of adjectives is very different from the last one. Uh, these strike me as much more sympathetic, uh, more understanding, more empathetic. Uh, the tone I get from students is that they, they feel bad for this narrator, <laughs> unlike the narrator over in the Edgar Allan Poe's story. We know right off the bat that this character and her family has decided to join her in this rented home where she can get some rest and recuperation. She's healing from something. We don't quite know yet in the beginning what that is, but we come to find out later on. And she immediately believes that this house is haunted. And she's not scared of the idea. She loves it. She thinks this sort of this romantic notion of a ghost roaming around this giant estate that they've decided to rent for a few months. So it's very important that we understand this, that this idea of a haunted house is already something she's constructed in her mind. As far as the other characters who are with her, who are they and what influence do they have not only over her physical well-being, but the character, the narrator's mental well-being? By far the most important character that sort of hovering around the narrator in, in her orbit is going to be her husband, John, who we know is a doctor. And he is practical, but a little extreme. Um, and he seems very ignorant to how much she's suffering. He's very much an authority figure, so she trusts his opinion as a man and as a doctor. Uh, but when you start to see your spouse as above you, then you allow him to be controlling uh, which has then created this very stifling marriage. It's not very happy. There's not romance between them. Um, in fact, instead of husband and wife, they seem to have taken on more the role of doctor and patient. And so he's very much in control, and she is being treated like a child. The narrator also mentions to us that her brother is a doctor. So here is another important and significant man in her life. Um, who she views as an authority figure. Here's someone else um, who not only has control over her, but also agrees with her husband that she is sick and that these two know what's best to cure her. We also have a couple of other female characters with us in the house. Um, now, although they hardly make an appearance in the story, 
they are still really influential and serve as some important symbols, and we'll talk about why in just a minute. Uh, but we have the narrator's sister-in-law, Jenny, who has come along to serve as the housekeeper. And there is the hired help, Mary, who is there in the house as a nursemaid uh, to help take care of the people. So what exactly is our narrator being treated for? Well, according to the narrator, John has told her that she has something called hysteria. Now, back in the Victorian era, this was just a very common word that was slapped onto women anytime they were experiencing anything as far as their physical health, their mental health, uh, emotional health, all of that. Anytime there was something wrong with the female, she was just simply labeled hysterical, and that was that. So she's not being taken very seriously, she's just been labeled, and that's it. And the cure for this was just to send her away, right, take her to a home where she can just rest in a bed and not be a nuisance or a bother to anyone else, and maybe she'll get better. But you have to remember that uh, this narrator was moving through what was very much a man's world. As you can imagine, medicine was controlled and dictated by men. Um, so. Obviously, men kind of looked out for each other, and if a man was sick, he was taken seriously, and he could have been suffering from a whole bunch of different things. Um, but there weren't men who were practicing medicine to benefit women, um, and, and unique diseases and disorders and other things related to female health. And so she was just labeled a nut and sent away to recuperate. But we know that there's something far more serious happening here. She's experiencing some sort of mental breakdown, for sure some depression. Because if you recall, what has she just gone through? Right? She's just had a baby. So she's most likely suffering with postpartum depression, which is a very real condition. And it was very real back then. There just wasn't a name for it because medicine practiced by men didn't care enough to look too closely at the symptoms and the cure. The narrator does tell us briefly how grateful she is for Jenny's help around the house and especially for how grateful she is for Mary, the nursemaid who's taking such good care of the baby. But one of the side effects is this, is they don't allow the narrator to see the baby. She wants to hold her baby, she wants to be with the baby, and they won't let her. And so these two women are sort of the living examples of what the ideal woman should be. The ideal housekeeper, the ideal wife and mother. And our narrator can't be those things right now because she's got to take care of herself first. But she's not getting a whole lot of sympathy from the people around her. They don't understand that. In fact, her two favorite hobbies of reading and writing, they actually forbid her from doing these two things. Now, if someone is suffering from a mental breakdown, wouldn't you think that the acts of reading and writing are just the things she would need to kind of help strengthen up her mind again? Because those things involve focus. They involve thinking. They involve performing an act, especially writing. Those would be ideal things for her to be doing to get better, but they're not allowing her to do those things. And in fact, she's sort of she sort of suggests to us that she doesn't like this treatment and it doesn't seem to be working. Something else to consider is the unusual place that they have decided to stick our narrator. Um, they have put her in the nursery, which as you know is a place where children usually sleep and play. The nursery is where you kept the baby. That's probably significant here because that's the message she's getting from the people around her. Um, they're treating her just like a child and they're putting her into a child's room. So besides the fact that she has been placed in a child's room, it has these unusual features that obviously she's noticed because she's telling us about them. There are teeth and bite marks on her bed, there are steel rings in the walls, and there are metal bar bars over the windows. Now at first glance that's not so unusual if you're talking about a children's playroom because, you know, kids chew on furniture, especially toddlers and little ones. The steel rings on the walls mean that there used to be some sort of play equipment anchored to the wall at one point. And of course, metal bars on the windows so the kids don't topple out of the, the second or third floor playroom. But for a grown-up, you put these things together and it feels a little more prison-like. It's almost sort of like a, like a dungeon. 
And how is that supposed to make this woman feel when she's going through a mental recovery process? You know, even if she's not thinking, oh, this feels like a prison, it's got to have some effect on her because she keeps telling her husband she doesn't want to be in this room anymore. So clearly, it's bothering her. And if you haven't noticed, <laughs> we haven't even talked about the ghost yet. So far, everything we've been talking about has been about her own emotional wellness and this environment that clearly is having an impact on her recovery, right? She's surrounded by male doctors who don't know anything about female health. They're all telling her she's hysterical. They're giving her a cure that's actually keeping her sick and not really doing much for her. And they put her in an environment that feels very belittling to her and condescending treating her like a baby herself. They're infantilizing her. But it gets worse. The room is papered in this really nasty, tattered, yellow wallpaper. It's just putrid. It's ugly, and she absolutely hates it. It's stained. It's peeling. It's clawed off in certain corners. It's just a nasty <laughs> wallpaper. At night, the supernatural activity begins to occur, where she thinks this woman is creeping out of the wallpaper and trying to rattle the bars on the windows to escape. And as you read the story, there are some increasing and more disturbing incidents of paranormal activity. Um, as far as the number of ghosts start to duplicate, you know, how many women exactly are trapped behind this wallpaper? Now, obviously, our narrator feels a, a deep connection with this ghost woman in the wallpaper because they both seem lonely, they both seem isolated, and they both really, really want to escape this room. So in desperation, the narrator peels the wallpaper off the wall to help free the woman, help get this lady out, um, and essentially absorbs this other woman. Because if you look at the last few sentences of the story, the narrator is using language to suggest that she is no longer herself, but is this other woman instead. Now, the ending of the story tends to be the most confusing part for students who were just reading it for the first time. At the end of the story, John has fainted, right? He's broken into the room to try and see what's going on with his wife because of all the noise and everything that's going on. And she is slowly creeping over his body, over and over again, just kind of creeping and crawling on top of this, this heap of, of her husband, right, on the floor. We can assume that John has fainted, but we have to be careful, because that's what the narrator tells us. Remember, everything we're hearing is from the narrator. And she even poses it as a question. She says, now, why should, she have, why should he have fainted? Why did my husband faint? My interpretation of the story, and you can disagree with this all you want, you are free to disagree, I think maybe she killed him, because in the final moments of the story she is completely out of her mind, and even she is wondering why did he faint? She is so far gone that she doesn't even know. And we can't really trust anything she says because the, the build-up to the story has been her decreasing mental health. She's been getting progressively worse. So I don't think it's just a faint. I think there's enough there to suggest that it was maybe a little bit more serious <laughs> than a faint. Uh, in fact, a lot worse than that. But that's just my reading of it. It's just my interpretation. But either way, whether he's dead or laying there on the floor, I think she did something to him. I think she assaulted him at the very least. All right, our third and final story for the week is Nightmare at 20,000 Feet by Richard Matheson. As you read this, this may have become familiar to you. It's sort of an American classic. Um, this was written in the late 50s, and it was turned into a very famous Twilight Zone episode back in the 60s, uh, where a passenger on an airliner sees this creature, this monster out on the wing, um, and is helpless and can do nothing to stop this thing from causing the damage to the aircraft that he sees it doing. Um, and in fact, every time he tries to call for help and get other people to look, uh, the thing flies away. <laughs> um, however, I don't want you to watch 
the Twilight Zone episode. Well, you can. You can watch it. It's great. Um, I don't want you to watch that and think, oh, well, that's the story. I've got it. The ending from the Twilight Zone is very different from the ending in the short story. Uh, so if you don't read the story and you write your essay based on the TV show episode, I'm going to know the difference because I know both the show and the short story it's based on like the back of my hand. So read the story. It's different from The Twilight Zone. I just want to point out this one is a little bit different as far as the narrators. In the first two stories, the main characters are speaking directly to us. Um, in this one, the main character is Mr. Wilson, but he is not the narrator. This is not written in first person like the other stories. This is written in third person. So the author is present everywhere, right? He's, he's describing the story in terms of he, she, it, they. So we are not hearing directly from Mr. Wilson the way we have heard directly from the other two narrators. So um, now obviously we are getting the story from his perspective. As a reader, we're there sort of looking over his shoulder. So he is our main character, but he is not the narrator like the others. When I ask students to list his most distinctive traits, I get usually nervous, angry, violent, suicidal, mentally ill, and depressed. So not exactly <laughs> the best list. He's, he has more in common with the first narrator from the Telltale Heart uh, more than he has with uh, the lady from the Yellow Wallpaper. We know that Mr. Wilson is a dreadfully nervous guy because of the little mo movements that he takes throughout the story. You know, he kind of jabs out his cigarette, he jams together his seatbelt pieces. Um, he's loaded himself up on medications because he is scared to fly, his stomach hurts, he's so nervous. Um, not exactly a guy you want to <laughs> sit next to on the airplane. And in fact, he tells us, I wish I'd just taken a train. He doesn't want to be on this airplane. I, can re I feel bad for him. I relate to him. On the rare occasion I'm on an airplane, I hold on to the armrests. I hold them up the entire flight because I'm convinced that if I let go of the armrest, the plane's going to go down. So um, don't worry. If we're ever on a plane together, I'm, g I'm going to keep us safe because I'm not going to let go of my seat. <laughs> we also know that Mr. Wilson is a painfully unhappy man. Whatever job he's in, whatever sales or insurance, whatever it is he does, he is miserable. And he feels like he's not leaving a legacy. He's just, it's boring. Life is boring to him. He carries a gun with him for logical reasons, at least that's what he's told himself. Um, but we also know he's a really suicidal guy and he's considered using it on himself. And if you look at the list behind me, is this really a guy that you <laughs> that you want to give a gun to? Something else to consider, the story was written I believe in 1959 uh, and this was a time when if you were in sales or insurance or some high profile job, you were allowed to carry a firearm uh, with you on an airplane. My, how times have changed. He also suffers from something called death wishes. He has a death wish, doesn't he? He has these really morbid fantasies where he imagines part of the plane getting ripped open and getting sucked out or, or walking over to the emergency door and just opening it up just to see what happens. Uh, he imagines the plane crashing. So that adds to that sense of him being suicidal, just other ways for him to die and leave his miserable life behind. We know that he makes others around him so uncomfortable <laughs> because the flight attendant is watching him the whole time. Every time he looks up at her she kind of smiles. Um, she acknowledges that there's something wrong with him and you know, you can imagine, these flight attendants they know who to look for. <laughs> they know which passengers to keep an eye on, and he is just a big bright spot on her radar. As this really uncomfortable flight progresses, Mr. Wilson begins to think he sees a creature out on the wing. This, this ghastly, ghoulish monster. The description of him in the story is wonderful. I love how he's described. So Mr. Wilson sees this thing playing out on the wing. It's tampering with the propellers. It's lifting up the... Uh, metal plates to see all the wires and, and the mechanical stuff underneath there. Now obviously Mr. Wilson is concerned because if the monster succeeds at whatever it is it's doing, 
it's, he's going to make the plane crash. Making matters worse is that no one else sees the monster because every time Mr. Wilson points it out to someone else, it jumps away, flies out of the scene. <laughs> so pretty quickly, Mr. Wilson realizes there's a game here. If he can get anyone else to see the creature, then the creature loses. But as long as the creature gets away in time, then Mr. Wilson loses. Now, Mr. Wilson tells us this thing is a gremlin. That's the name he's given it. Um, this might not be as obvious to readers today, but back in the late 50s, a lot of people knew what gremlins were. Um, back during World War II, whenever there were mechanical problems with our airplanes, any of our aircraft, or if any of them crashed or behaved strangely for absolutely no reason, they were playfully, these, these little issues of mechanical issues, were playfully, sort of jokingly blamed on gremlins, little creatures who were getting in and messing up the gears, messing up all the works. Um, and our society back in the 40s and 50s absorbed this idea of gremlins. So anytime something went wrong with anything mechanical, it was blamed on gremlins. So here in the 1950s, audiences were very aware that this is maybe what one would actually look like as it's trying to bring down an aircraft. There is this wonderful moment, both in the story and in the Twilight Zone episode, where the pilot comes out to see what's going on. And Mr. Wilson says, look, there's this thing out on the wing. And the pilot tells him, be quiet. Don't, don't talk about it. We, see it. we see it too. We know it's there. Don't worry. And at first, Wilson is very relieved until he realizes that the pilot is just pulling one over on him. He realizes they're just humoring him. They're just playing with him to calm him down. But Mr. Wilson says, no, I understand. I know exactly what you're trying to do to me right now. So poor Mr. Wilson, <laughs> he's watching this gremlin destroy the airplane wing and there's nothing he can do about it. And then he realizes, I've got a gun. And he thinks, well, I'm gonna shoot through the window. But if you remember, he stops himself and thinks, well, no, these windows are pretty tough the bullet might ricochet and hit somebody else. So consider that, that little piece of evidence if you're writing about Mr. Wilson. He stops himself from shooting through the window because he realizes what physically can happen and how that can hurt someone else who's completely innocent. Instead, <laughs> Mr. Wilson goes to the emergency exit door, throws it open, and shoots at the creature. He shoots at it, it falls off the wing, everything seems okay. Now for Mr. Wilson, he has all the proof he needs because at one point the plane starts kind of shaking and rattling a little bit and he knows it's the gremlin doing it. At least that's what he's told himself in his mind, right? And he's got the gash on his forehead when the creature scratched at him, clawed at him. That's all the proof he needs. However, if it's not a monster, then why was the plane shaking? Could be the storm outside or the turbulence, not a monster. And the gash on his forehead could have just been some debris that flew back and hit him when he opened up the door. So none of those things we can really conclusively say was the monster that he was seeing. In fact, when he's loaded up on a stretcher, uh, the ambulance drivers are like, oh, that's the weirdest way I've ever seen anyone try and commit suicide. But the thing is, this story has sort of a, a happy ending in a really weird and twisted way. The Mr. Wilson we met at the beginning of the flight is a di very different man from the one we meet as he's being taken away. We meet a man who's hopeless, who's at the end of his rope, who sees no reason for living. But at the end of the story, how does he view himself? <laughs> he thinks he's a hero. He's saved this entire plane load of passengers. Now, even if the monster never existed, even if that was something that he created in his mind, just on top of the, the medications he took and his nervousness for flying or whatever the case is. He has now given himself a purpose. He did something great, and he's okay now. All right, friends, that concludes our three stories this week. Uh, I hope you liked them. I hope that there was enough in there that you enjoyed these creepy little stories, uh, and they give us a taste of what's to come throughout the semester when we continue talking about murderers, uh, ghosts, and monsters. So again, look for future videos about how to structure your essay, how to put everything together. 
uh, and we will leave no stone unturned. We're going to make the writing process as simple as we can. Like I told you back on day one, there's no magic to this. It's just about following some really simple steps, and you can get the job done. So until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and I will talk to you soon. Bye, 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 bye.